Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Councillor Wendy Grant-John and, and uh, the elders who opened our ceremony and our, our session for the next two days uh, here on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. It's a pleasure for me to be here on a stage with Grand Chief Ed John, uh, Grand Chief uh, Stuart Phillip, as well as, as Chief Maureen Chapman, as we begin the fourth annual leaders gathering here in, uh, in Vancouver. It's great to be in a room filled with youth, filled with MLAs of all political parties, filled with leaders who are coming together to make progress for their communities and for our province. The greetings that I bring uh, from my area of Juan de Fuca, Lankford Juan de Fuca, Malahat Juan de Fuca, it's had many names as an electoral district, but to me, it's the traditional territory of the Sauk, uh, Pachidat, and Beecher Bay First Nations. And I want to pay tribute to Chief Gordon Planis uh, from Souk, uh, Chief Jeff Jones from Pachidat, and Chief Russ Chips from Beecher Bay for inspiring me as a new MLA many, many years ago to have a better understanding of the challenges that the nations in my community face and the opportunity that gave me as I traveled across British Columbia to communities represented and, and traditional to the, all of the people uh, in this room, whether it be on the North Coast, in the peace country, uh, in the interior, or all across uh, the Lower Mainland and Vancouver Island. It's been inspiring to be able to go back home and to talk to Gordy and Russ and Jeff and others uh, within the communities that have been in my area for over a thousand years to talk about the challenges of modernity, the challenges of working together with multiple levels of what was pre previously called the crown. And I think uh, in my conversations leading up to this, uh, this gathering with Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, with, uh, with Grand Chief Ed John, and, and, and with uh, Chief Maureen Chapman, what we've been hearing is a sense of optimism that there will be more than hollow words coming out of our two days. And I, I am very much committed, and our government is very much committed to ensuring that we are not starting anew, we're building on the work that has come before us. I think uh, most importantly, I, I, I think back to just a few moments ago uh, when, when Wendy said that we are going to be working together not just with the people in this room, but the ancestors of the people in this room, building on the relationships that have been established over time and building stronger relationships as we go forward. I, I want to also acknowledge uh, the impacts of the fires uh, that have greeted my government in our first uh, six or seven weeks. It has been, uh, by any measure, the worst fire season in BC's history. And I had the opportunity to visit the Ashcroft First Nation uh, just a week and a half ago and tour the territory and see the, the devastation. Uh, a dozen homes gone out of only 32 on the reserve. That's a profound impact. And we need to not just acknowledge what has happened, but we need as a government and as a, as a people working together, we need to be there in the fall, we need to be there in the spring, and we need to be there next summer as citizens, at communities, indigenous people rebuild and prepare for the years ahead, the challenges of climate change, the challenges that we all face together. Using uh, traditional understandings of how the land has managed changes uh, is critically important. And I acknowledge uh, Chief Judy Wilson, who today reminded us all, just before we started outside, that if we are not, as a government, as a federal government, as a provincial government, are not going to listen and learn from the experiences of First Nations, their understanding of the land, we're going to fail again next season or the season after that. So a, a reminder that working together will give us a better outcome time after time after time. I wanted to say at the outset that it's important that over the next two days, we recognize and acknowledge that this is about accountability for your new government, and it's also about an understanding of how we can work together. I want to say that at the outset, uh, when we formed a government working with the Green Party Caucus, uh, it was a big challenge to come up with a way that we could all work together. And I'm very pleased that uh, many of the BC Liberal MLAs have accepted the invitation to come and join us today, and the Green Party Caucus is here as well. I think it's important that as we start this new beginning 
in a new reconciliation and relationship building with the province of British Columbia and indigenous peoples that we do this together. This is not a party issue, it's not a partisan issue, it's in the interests of indigenous people, it's in the interests of the province that we work together on a genuine understanding of reconciliation and respect. And that is why in my uh, letters to my ministers when we started this government, I included at the, at the top of every letter to every minister that we need as a government to embrace and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. We needed to ensure that we were meeting all of the calls to action within the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and we needed to respect Silcoteen and other decisions that have come from our courts that recognize without any question the existence of rights and title for Indigenous people in British Columbia. And it's not just those lofty documents that we need to focus on. We also need to focus on building relationships and trust. And I am committed to doing that with you in this room and outside of this room in the life of the government that is to come. We have an agreement with the Green Party to uh, have stable government for all British Columbians, and I believe it is a unique opportunity to work with a new federal government that is also committed to true reconciliation and a true understanding of the importance of embracing the UN Declaration. To have um, the Justice Minister here last night at our opening reception, uh, it's inspiring to me to think of a, a British Columbian uh, a First Nations woman to hold the position of Justice Minister, I believe is, should be inspiring to all of us. And there's a great burden on her shoulders, but if we stand with her, we can achieve great things. I want to acknowledge also that our legislature has changed not just in the configuration of the government, but who is sitting in those seats in Victoria. I want to acknowledge first and foremost my friend and, and Minister of Advanced Education, Melanie Mark, the first First Nations woman to hold the cabinet position in British Columbia. I want to acknowledge Chief Ellis Ross uh, uh, from the Heisland Nation, who is representing the BC Liberal Party in the, the constituency of uh, Skeena. And I also want to acknowledge Adam Olson, who is a representative of the Green Party, also a First Nations member, and my dear friend, uh, Carol James, who identifies herself as just my dear friend, but uh, we all know her to be uh, not only a, a woman of great character, but someone who has been working with First Nations for as long as she can remember. And, and to have this knowledge, this understanding within our legislature, I believe, gives us a real step forward as we work together, Liberals, Greens, New Democrats, to ensure that we have genuine reconciliation, not just hollow words. That's my commitment to you today as we start this gathering, and I want you to hold me accountable. I know, Judy, I can't see you, but I know you're going to. I know Grand Chief Stuart Phillip is going to, as is Maureen, as is Ed. And that is also the responsibility of every one of the delegates here, the youth delegates particularly. We are working together to make sure that your life as Indigenous peoples is better than that of your parents and your grandparents and those that came before you. I believe passionately that if we hang together and hold fast to the values that, represent, that are all represented in this room, whether they be from the North Coast or the interior or Vancouver Island, whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous, we all want the best for our families and our communities. We're Working together, we will get those outcomes. I'm committed to that, and I know you are as well. I want to also touch upon uh, some of the challenges we'll face with respect to treaty discussions. Many nations represented in this room have spent uh, a quarter of a century at tables with the federal and provincial government working on, in good faith to ensure that they have better outcomes in their communities. And that's going to be a challenge as we all work together to reinvigorate uh, the mandates of the two representatives of the Crown, as well as ensuring that those nations at those tables get the respect they deserve and need based on changes in where we are when they started those, ne those negotiations back in the early 1990s. The Silcoteen decision, in my opinion, makes it absolutely crystal clear to all British Columbians and all Canadians that we are starting from a foundation of rights and title existing, so the notion of extinguishment is extremely difficult to manage at a negotiating table, as you can all well, rec uh, well understand. That's a challenge for us, but not an insurmountable one. I believe we need to build on the progress and success of many nations over the past 25 years and ensure that we take the information we have now at our disposal 
proposal, the unequivocal understanding of rights and title, and we weave that into the discussions that have been taking place at tables around this province so that we can all benefit from these new understandings. We have a path to walk down. As my friend Melanie says, we're all paddling together. I don't know how we get a paddle on the path, but somehow we manage to mix our metaphors because the symbols are pretty straightforward. Standing together, working together, New Democrat government, Green Caucus, Liberal Caucus, Indigenous peoples from around this great province, we are the most blessed people on the planet, and if we work together, imagine what we can do. Just imagine what the next four years will be. I am so inspired by the opportunity to stand before you and say, let's make progress. Let's not dwell on the past. Let's be shaped by our past and have a better future for our kids and our grandkids. Thank you so much for coming for these two days. I look forward to the meetings we will have. I look forward to the success we will have. And I look forward to four years of success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Premier. Our next speaker is the Hereditary Chief of the Tlatsin Nation, uh, lo located in northern British Columbia. His um, experience, his skill, his knowledge in uh, Indigenous issues, locally, regionally, nationally, internationally, is uh, well known. I would just note as a part of his biography that he's a member of that small but growing group of Indigenous peoples who have held government cabinet positions, having served in the, as a Minister of Ch Children and Family Development in the previous uh, NDP government. Please help me welcome Grand Chief Ed John on behalf of the First Nations Summit. Hadi, masi edetu skana kani insuli be no atiasta kandi ne 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 nat ne kene njaba keyo na zatil su stio the honesty kana padas to ne atiastak ne to edetu zatil cha ne ba tenaditli. I wanted to begin by acknowledging and thanking the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish Nation peoples on whose ancestral lands we are gathered. It's a beautiful morning to, to, to have this gathering and to acknowledge that they are the ancestral owners of this territory. I want to acknowledge our dear elder from Saved Tooth for the prayer this morning to warm our hearts, to remind us that there are peoples in other parts of the world who are experiencing serious challenges from Mother Nature. And we pray for our relatives in the Caribbean, many of whom that we've gotten to know over the many years at the international level, whose homes are being devastated and whose lives are being changed by what is happening um, outside. This morning, um, I was with the Premier and our First Nations representatives and Minister Fraser out in the front to talk to the media about this gathering. It was an expression of optimism on my part, and as I looked to the east, I saw the sun, and it was red. And I thought about our relatives and friends to other parts of this province who have experienced um, hum huge impact from the wildfires, our peoples in our communities and the non-Aboriginal peoples as well, who have been um, dislocated from their communities. I think that what we have in front of us is this dramatic period of change arising from what's happening in the atmosphere, climate change. I just wanted to, to say those uh, few remarks at, at the outset. Um, I would like to acknowledge the elders who are here and certainly the youth, um, opening the door for them to be involved in these discussions, to listen, to learn, to contribute as young leaders as well. To the Premier and to your, your cabinet members um, and your, your officials, um, uh, thank you for helping organize and host this meeting. 
last year. Um, you were speaking about the recognition of the Declaration and Chilcotin and Aboriginal rights. Last year, I remember my friend Richard Fife sitting at a table by himself over here, the Attorney General who, was, who didn't really think much of the Declaration, but I'm hoping that I, I have 400 booklets of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I'd like to give him one, too. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing, I'm just, you know, like the province has been in, in dark places to, for far too long. I want to acknowledge uh, Andrew Weaver and the Green Party members, um, Adam Olson and uh, Susan, Sonia Fernstino, um, this agreement that you have with them, the supply agreement. Um, where both parties have committed to ensuring that this issue of indigenous peoples um, is one that's so fundamental to all of us that this declaration forms a very fundamental part of the relationship and the emerging relationship. And that's what I talked about, the optimism out there. But we need to see translated into action on the ground so that we are able to make serious gains in the social economic side of, of our peoples and our communities, the day-to-day -day issues that our peoples have to face um, housing, education, uh, water, uh, you name it. These are the ongoing issues, the challenges that our community members face with opioids, um, drugs, um, that, that are many of which is rooted the intergenerational trauma or directly as a result of the Indian residential schools that all of us in our communities experience in this province. The the book that I was talking about, the Declaration, has three documents. One of which is the Ten Principles of Reconciliation that the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, brought forward. The other document are the 94 calls to action that are so important to the discussion. This has generated an incredible dialogue in this country, unprecedented, unprecedented in this country's history. And we have to be thankful to the commissioners for having generated that dialogue, and we need to continue on that path. Um, because there will be dark clouds out there. Um, those ivory towers over here with the big champions of industry have, been, have always been fearful that any recognition of our rights would be the demise of their, their profits. And that should never be the case. They can have their profits, but we need to have our profits as well. We need to benefit from our lands, our territories, and resources like anyone else. And this is what will take us out of this place. The social economic issues that the provinces and the federal government can deal with by programs and services, but what will truly take us out is our ability to rely on the resources that we have and to be able to generate revenues from that, from that foundation, whether it's a single tree with stumpage, or whether it's uh, salmon in, in the rivers or other resources in this province, we have a right to make decision about what is in our territories. Every single tree is to be cut. We have to have a say in that. And we have to benefit from the revenues that are generated from that. In the Delgamo case, the Supreme Court of Canada have said very clearly that Aboriginal title exists in this province, that it's a legal interest in land, a legal interest in land, and that we have the right to make decisions about that legal interest. And importantly, it has an inescapable economic component, which means we can raise revenues, not just revenue sharing. We should be able to raise revenues, including revenue sharing. So the Declaration and the law in this country provides an important framework, political will. I said the dark clouds have always been there. And we need to be mindful and we need to continue to educate and talk to the public, to the industry, to the municipal leaders, to the labor leaders. I want to thank BC Business Council and the BC Federation of Labor for their, their the hosting of the reception last night. These are important building blocks that we have been working for so long. We have to take this opportunity that's in front of us. I want to conclude by one. I talked about the red sun this morning. 
In 2012, December 21st, I was in Guatemala. I was invited. I was a chairman of the chairperson of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. It's an international body of um, experts, 16 experts who advise the UN United Nations on Indigenous Issues globally. I was invited by the Mayan leaders to come to their territories uh, to witness the end of the 13th Pactoon, or the, the end of the 12th Pactoon, 5,125-year calendar cycle, and they were called savages. So as I left to go down there, I saw in the, in the media in the U.S. and Canada, oh my God, the world's going to come to an end on December 21st. And so my message out there was, you know, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to make sure that the world is saved and make sure that when I come back, you, you recognize this effort and put a statue or two up somewhere. <laughs> Never happened, but the world didn't end. So here's, here's what, what the priests, the, the Mayan spiritual leaders said. This is the end of 12th back to in the 5,125 5, years and we gathered through the night, and in the morning we waited for, for the, um, the baby son, the new, new son, to come up that day to mark the beginning of the 13th Bactoon. But it was cloudy. And so as I stood there, the ambassador from Mexico was standing next to me, and he had his iPhone out and said, Ed, Ed, he says, look at this. And as I looked at it, I saw all of the planets and the sun were lined up like this. How did the Mayan people know that? They were astronomers, they're mathematicians, they had figured it out 12, 60,000 years ago that they knew this, the beginning. And so what they said, the, the spiritual leader said, this next 5,125 years will be marked by the feminine energy, one that comes from our women. And so I want to conclude by saying that the important role that our mothers, our grandmothers, our wives, our sisters, our daughters play in our lives each and every day, and to remember and to acknowledge that we're in this new era of um, feminine energy, and to our leaders from the, our communities who are, who are the women leaders and counselors and chiefs, I want to acknowledge your, your tremendous contributions that you make each and every day. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Grand Chief. Our next speaker is also a hereditary chief of her nation, having been handed that responsibility in 1999. And since the 90s, she has been working with her council in her own home community of Skawaluk First Nation. So please help me welcome the acting regional chief for the BCAFN, Maureen Chapman. Good morning. Good morning, <laughs> seeing if you're awake. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, before I, for, I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil on whose traditional territory we're meeting, and acknowledge them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. I'd also like to acknowledge Elder Deanna George. Thank you so much for your beautiful words always touches the heart and starts our day in a good way. And thank you, Wendy. Sorry I walked in a couple minutes late um, for your comments, but thank you so much. I also want to sincerely acknowledge those who were and those who continue to be affected by the wildfire crisis in our province. This summer, we saw many of our brothers and sisters abruptly forced to evacuate their territories, in a number of cases returning to find devastation and loss. We saw many of our nations step up to welcome and care for evacuees, and for that I am so proud and encouraged, as this speaks to our resilience and that we First Nations people look out for our own, our communities, and our neighbors. And as we move into the fall and winter seasons, I want you to know that we, as the BC Assembly of First Nations, the First Nations Leadership Council, and all of our members here are here for you and will continue to assist and support you in any way possible. 
elders, youth, chiefs, leaders, and provincial and federal ministers. Today we gather on Coast Salish territory as many nations here with the new government led by Premier John Horgan. I think it's fair to say that politically speaking this summer was one for the books. I have congratulated Premier Horgan in previous meetings and I wish to do so today. We walked out to the stage this morning and I said we're walking out as a team. This is the small part of the team and I acknowledge also the cabinet and caucus as well as Andrew Weaver and his caucus for setting the stage to take significant strides on our journey together towards building a new relationship between the province and First Nations, one founded, as you've heard earlier, on respect and recognition of our inherent rights and title as the first peoples of this land. I am pleased to see Premier Horgan has made a commitment to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The Premier has also committed to breathing life into the historic Chilcotin decision through policy and legislation that acknowledges our title to our lands. If we are to move forward with substantive reconciliation and a meaningful government-to-government -government relationship, we're going to have to try new things to be creative, and to quote Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, to be bold. Change won't happen if we maintain the status quo. Now is the time for action. In our caucus yesterday, the Chief's Caucus, we need to get to work and stop talking. We've done the work, and we need to move ahead with this. Historically, regardless of which party formed government in BC, we have been left out of decisions that directly impact our, impact our communities and territories and ignored by this province and this country. This isn't to say we've sat idly by. To the contrary, it's hard work and determination of our people that has gotten us to where we are today. And while there is always room for improvement, we're committed to building on our successes. Still though, I believe the onus is on our people as has always been the case, to continue to assert ourselves in ensuring the government lives up to their commitments made in good faith. I have had the opportunity to review the Premier's mandate letters to the Cabinet, and it is clear that BC's new government is committed to true, lasting reconciliation and restoring trust, whether it be through meaningful climate action, addressing the poverty we have experienced for too long, or through finally recognizing and supporting Indigenous peoples to participate fully in the economy. On that last point, I must say I'm especially excited to get to work on negotiating for a fair share of BC's gaming industry. I raise my hands to those who for decades have worked so hard on this issue. Grand Chief Joe Hall, many of you know, Ken Watts, Jay Johnson, Nolan Charles, to name a few, that have not given up and continue to do the work in this field. It's no secret that BC is the only province without some sort of gaming revenue sharing. So I welcome this commitment as our nations require consistent, predictable funding in order to support the social and economic nation building and rebuilding that is long overdue. Our families are the backbone of our communities and the health and wellness of our children and youth are vital to this process. I have seen firsthand the struggles of so many of our communities and this has cemented my resolve and deepened my understanding of the need for First Nations jurisdiction over issues relating to our children and families. As our sister, Melanie Mark, said last week, when we lift people up, all our communities benefit. If we are to lift our people up to strengthen community wellness and well-being, we must start with our children. That is why I am so delighted to know that Premier Horgan and Minister Conroy are committed to working with us to reform what is truly a broken system. 
Reconciliation is not simply an indigenous issue. It is a pan-Canadian issue that requires real and concrete actions. The status quo must be rejected. And I am confident we finally have the right partners in Victoria to paddle with us as we embark on this journey together. In closing, we must continue to be guided by our ancestors and remember who we are and where we come from. With the uses of our languages, our teachings, values, and our distinct cultures, we will emerge as stronger people with stronger communities and thriving nations. Thank you, and I look forward to a very positive gathering. And as I said this morning, I hold my hands up to all of you that do this work and thank the Creator for placing us where we need to be today. All my relations. Thank you very much, Regional Chief. Our next speaker has been an important part of our family and political life for over four decades. He has served in a variety of positions for the Penticton Indian Band, Band Administrator, Land Management, Education, Economic Development, Planning. He served as an elected member of the Council for over two decades, and he's proud to be in his seventh consecutive term as the President of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Please help me welcome Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. Why has go out peace not seal and try a squeeze a suit? I want to begin by acknowledging the Tsleil-Waututh, the Squamish, and the Musqueam. And um, I would like to uh, thank our elder for the opening prayer. And I would like to thank Wendy Grant John for her opening remarks, for her welcome. And quite often I listen to Wendy a little more closely than Ed. As we all know in this room, this is the fourth time we've gathered like this. Uh, this being somewhat different, I congratulate and commend Premier Horgan and his government for being inclusive to invite um, members of the, uh, the opposition and other parties into the room. And I think that it's a reflection on the commitments and the promises and what those represent that uh, gave us this opportunity to, to be here and once again to, to have an opportunity to come together in the province of British Columbia, the uh, government of British Columbia, um, the economic forces, uh, within British Columbia and the indigenous peoples to once again reach a point in our history where reconciliation moves beyond being political rhetoric and becomes a way of life at every level in society in British Columbia. It's been a very, very long, tiring, and frustrating journey. And the last time that I had any sense of hope or optimism was under the um, previous uh, Campbell government, when there was an effort to put together recognition and reconciliation legislation, which clearly moved beyond the rhetoric and was actually going to move us to a place that we've never been in the province of BC. And sadly, that self-destructed 
as a consequence of the archaic thinking in the province of British Columbia, the racist attitudes, and the fear of the seismic shift that that legislation would have represented. And we worked so hard to, to get the issue to the point that it was at that particular time. And in my long years of involvement in the issues of our people, I believe that that was one of the, the most heartbreaking moments to know that we had come that close and we failed to, to achieve what we set out to do. And here we are again. And I greatly appreciate the commitments, the promises, and the goodwill on the part of the Premier Horgan and his government in regard to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the issue of free prior and informed consent, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action, and of course, um, implementing what the Chilcotin decision represents vis-a-vis -vis our unextinguished Aboriginal title interests in the province of British Columbia. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge Andrew Weaver, um, Adam Olson, and Sonia Firstenau of the BC Green Party for giving us this opportunity, this wonderful opportunity to be in this room and to be in a position to uh, breathe life into all of these issues. I want to thank the BC Green Party for their vision. I want to thank them for their vision, for their integrity, and for their courage to um, know and understand that in British Columbia, we all recognize the need for change to take these issues to the next level. The recent wildfire issue that has swept through all parts of the province of British Columbia should serve notice on all of us that our current inability to coordinate all orders of government, including indigenous government, into the responsibilities of properly caretaking the land are, have uh, failed us. And uh, we need to get our act together. I would suspect that everyone in this room knows and understands that although the fire season was described as the worst in the history of the province of British Columbia, I suspect next year will be worse and the following year will be even worse than that. The trajectory of climate change is such that these are not one-off situations. I also believe that, um, as many of you recall, just before the fire season swept through the province, we were dealing with flooding issues. And that is going to be the future of our world. And so there are very powerful and compelling reasons for all of us to come together for First Nations to have the ability and the capacity and the resources to stand and defend our communities, that we have all worked so hard to, to bring them to the point that they are. I have said on many, many occasions, aside from reconciliation is not for wimps, I've also said that a rising tide carries all boats. And when Indigenous peoples do well, everyone does well, and vice versa. So we have to rise above our fears, and we have to rise above our attitudes, and we have to walk forward into the future together for the sake of our children and our grandchildren and those generations unborn. And I speak collectively of all of the people within the province of British Columbia. If we are going to succeed to confront the challenges that lie before us, and it's a tremendous challenge to let go, to let go of those, those um, 
attitudes that we carry that permeate all levels of government. Along with Grand Chief Ed John and Regional Chief Maureen, I, I want to say very clearly that we support and we embrace the commitments of the BC Green Party and the BC NDP government as it relates to showing results with respect to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the TRC and Chilcotin. But we know that there are hangovers within the bureaucracy of government that um, you know, um, are unacceptable. And if you want to be part of the movement towards reconciliation, peace and prosperity, and you harbor attitudes that reflect back on the backward thinking of previous regimes, I suggest you find another, another um, career because there's no place for you. There's no place for you in this vision. We need people that are committed. We cannot afford to squander this opportunity that lies before us. And once again, I am going to commit to support the promises and the commitments that were brought forward by the BC Green Party and the BC NDP I know that our leadership here in the province of British Columbia knows and understands the crisis situation in First Nations communities vis-a-vis -vis fentanyl, vis-a-vis -vis youth suicides, massive unemployment, and um, you know, terrible infrastructure issues needs to be addressed now. And so a year from now, I'm hoping that we gather together in a room like this and we reflect back on the previous 12 months of making real concrete progress on this journey that we're starting here today. So I, I urge all of the leaders in the room to make the most of their contact with the government officials in the next couple of days, to be bold, to be up front, to, to be in their face, and to serve notice on government that we will accept nothing less than progress than follow through and success in regard to what we're setting out here to do. I've always believed that whether it be personal, business, or political, our success rises and falls on our ability to establish relationships and sustain those relationships. Jonah and I have been together for 40 years We've been married for 33. We have 15 grandchildren. And everything that we do, we do through the lens of what's in the best interest of our grandchildren. And I suggest to you that that has to be a province that um, totally provides uh, leadership in terms of rec what reconciliation really is. So I wish you well. Why? Limp, limp.